We are in our third episode of the Abundantly More series with an episode titled, Know the Power of God. If you want to live abundantly more, you have to know who this God is that you're serving. Hey, it's Amber, wife, mother, type A child of God. Here are little things we look at everyday issues from a biblical perspective with one simple goal, to know and love God more. Thanks for listening. I think a lot of times we spend a lot of time in the New Testament, which is great. But as we are reading about Jesus, he is so much like us. And because he set aside his divine nature in order to walk with us, to be Emmanuel, God with us, to walk the earth, to be human, to show the attributes of humanity that we know. For instance, Jesus was tired. He fell asleep in the boat. We know that he was tired uh, when he got to the well where the Samaritan woman uh, was. He was often weak in appearance. He didn't uh, exhibit his power to the full. He didn't just wipe out his enemies. He was meek and lowly. He walked away. He allowed the crowds to leave him. He wasn't the superstar. He was when he was healing people and people wanted to see a miracle. But when they didn't get what they want, they walked away. And he didn't force anybody to follow him. And so a lot of times when we see Jesus in the New Testament, in his lowliness, it can be easy to see Jesus as a friend and not God. It can be easy to forget what Jesus was capable of, and what God is capable of. And the world doesn't, you know, try to help us remember this by any stretch of the imagination. Everybody seems to be overwhelmed anymore. It just, you know, you've got your hot mess mamas, and you've got people who are burned out before they even get started. You know, there are memes that go around that say, like, this is the worst Friday ever because it's Tuesday or something like that. People are always showing how overwhelmed they are and how this life is not what they want it to be. And life in this sinful world is never going to be what we want it to be. It just isn't. We're not going to get that until we get to heaven. But as we navigate this crazy life that we live in, we can do so much better and we will do so much better when we remember who God is. So first of all, who is this God that we serve? Well, he's the creator. And he's not just the creator of the world. And that in itself is amazing because I can't even, you know, hardly bake a cake or make chocolate chip cookies. And yet with words, God spoke the universe into being. Not just the world, not just the animals, not just the sea, not just the birds, but the universe. So God knows every star by name. We don't even know how many stars there are. We haven't even realized the extent of the galaxies that we live in. We, we cannot comprehend. It is far, far, far too big for us to understand. And yet God knows it all. He created it all with words. He is the God who also destroyed it. He opened up the floodgates and destroyed the world. He is the God who can rain fire down from heaven. He is the God who can part the sea so that his people can walk across on dry ground. He can also cause the sea to go back into its place, wiping out Pharaoh's army in the process. He is the God who can make water come from a rock, who can rain bread from heaven. He's the God who can make walls come down fortified walls, not just the little gate, not just a few stones, fortified, tall, thick walls come down with a shout. He is the God who can give people a land, who can defeat armies, who can raise the dead, who can heal people, who can withhold rain from a land. In the New Testament, we see that Jesus is the God who can heal. 
He can make bread multiply. He can raise the dead. He can cause demons to flee and run away. He can calm a storm by just telling it to be still. And at the same time, when he does that, he can cause this boat that has been stuck for hours in the middle of the lake to suddenly reach land. We serve an almighty, all-powerful God. And that's so important for us to remember. Last week, I was able to spend two hours in the presence of someone who has the spiritual gift of faith. If you haven't had anybody talk about the spiritual gift of faith before, it's a spiritual gift just like other gifts. Some people have the gift of hospitality or leadership or encouragement or serving or giving. And some people have the gift of faith, which is believing that God is a big God and encouraging the rest of us to do the same. I spent two hours in the presence of this person last week, and I have not gotten over it yet. I needed that so much because I, for some reason, can get so clouded with the things of the world and with just circumstances, and I forget how big God is. So being in the presence of someone who has the gift of faith is just an unbelievable blessing. Okay, so this God, who is an almighty God, how does that impact our faith walk? Hebrews chapter 11 is called the by faith chapter, or just the faith chapter. The writer of the book of Hebrews in chapter 11 takes us through all these people who live by faith. And he starts explaining how Abel lived by faith and Enoch lived by faith and Noah lived by faith and Abraham and goes down the line. And then he finally says, and I don't even have enough time to tell you about Samuel and all these other people that he lists. But he starts chapter 11 by saying this, faith is confidence in what we hope for in assurance about what we do not see. Faith is knowing. It's knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt. Yep, you can't see it. Doesn't matter. It's knowing and believing even when you can't see it. He goes on to say a few verses later in verse 6, Without faith, without that knowing and believing, it is impossible to please God. You cannot. There's no way to please God without faith. End of story done. You have to believe. He says this, Because anyone who comes to him, to God, must believe that he exists, first and foremost. If you're even struggling to wonder if there is a God, God, if you are there, whoa. No, if you're coming to him, you have to believe he exists, that he's really there, that he really hears you, and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. In fact, we're told in the book of James, James chapter 1, verse 6, when you ask, You must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. Don't even ask if you don't believe, because you're not going to receive. You have to believe, A, that God exists, and B, that he rewards those who seek him. Rewards. What is that? Reward is something given in recognition of one's efforts. In this in this circumstances is just for coming to God and believing that he is able to do something. He rewards us. Now I did a little research on rewards. Some big deal in our society right now, nine out of 10 companies have a reward program. And you know, it doesn't matter if you go to buy shoes or if you go to buy coffee, wherever you go, they want to sign you up for your rewards program. You take a flight You know, they've all got rewards program. You get so many points. If you go so many times, if you spend so much money, your points can add up and your points can give you this and this and this and this and this. Here's the deal. 75% of people say they purchase more because of these reward programs. So for instance, I wasn't going to go buy a coffee, but since my app told me I got, you know, 50% off or I could get any size for $3 or 
didn't really need a new pair of shoes. But once I found out that my points were going to give me whatever, well, then I decided to spend the money. In fact, it's estimated that companies make an extra 15 to 25 percent revenue from those who follow them. So companies are getting the benefit of making you know that you're rewarded for loyalty. But I wonder if we shouldn't be paying far more attention to the rewards that we get from going to God in faith. We spend a lot of time complaining, running around, trying to figure things out ourselves, worrying, wringing our hands, instead of realizing that God rewards those who earnestly seek him. So what is your impossible situation? Is it an addiction that you haven't been able to get through, get past? You want to stop, but oh man, it is so hard. Or is it that relationship that's just severed and broken? You don't know what to do about it. Is it a job? Is it the pain of loss that just smothers you, that you don't know how to get through and get past? What is your impossible? Is it a door that's been closed that you haven't been able to get through? Whatever that is, the job, the ministry, the impact. Is it something with your children? Is it something with your church? Whatever it is, we have to know that we have a a God who can do the impossible. And when we know that, we act differently. Now, I want to tell you how. So Charles Spurgeon wrote the book, Prayer and Spiritual Warfare. I started reading it last year. I got about three-fourths of the way done. It is a huge book. It's like um, 560-some pages, maybe 70. It's a huge book. I got through about three-fourths of it last year. But I have all kinds of notes in this book. But this is one that really made me aware of my prayer life. It says this. Suppose you should say to me, you who keep a warehouse in the city, sir, call at my office and use my name and say that you are to give you such and such a thing. I would go in, use your name, and I would obtain my request as a matter of right and a matter of necessity. This is virtually what Jesus Christ says to us. If you need anything from God, all that the Father has belongs to me. Go and use my name. Suppose that you give me give a man your checkbook signed with your name and left blank to be filled in as he chooses. That would be very close to what Jesus has done in these words. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. John 14 verse 14. If I had a good name at the bottom of the check, I would be sure that it would be cashed when I went to the bank with it. So when you have got Christ's name, to whom the very justice of God has become a debtor and whose merits have claims with the Most High, when you have Christ's name, there is no need to speak with fear and trembling and bated breath. Oh, waver not and let not faith stagger. When you plead the name of Christ, you plead that which shakes the gates of hell and that which the hosts of heaven obey, and God himself feels the sacred power of that divine plea. A blank check. Ask whatever you want in my name, and it will be given to you. It is like knowing the secret word, or the secret knock, or having the keys to your father's house. You don't have to wait outside You don't have to wonder if you can get in. Nope. You can go straight to the throne of God because you have access to the throne of God, not because of what you've done, but because of the righteousness that comes from Jesus Christ, because of the blood that was shed. He has made us right with God. And we are sons and daughters of the King, so we can go right in. Now, I know what you might be thinking. That's great, Amber. Here's the deal. Um, I've been praying for some things for a long time. And God hasn't done anything. So 
What's up with that? Is God hearing? Is God listening? Is he doing anything? Well, if you've listened to me at all, you've probably heard me say this before, but this is one of my all-time favorite things to remember. It's from the People's Bible Book of Matthew, which is mine is completely falling apart because I've opened it to this page so many times. And I've quoted this in at least two books that I've written, maybe more, because it's so important for me to know and understand and remember, and hopefully you too. So in Matthew 7, starting at verse 7, Jesus said this, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Okay, that sounds great. But again, I'm going to go back to, I've prayed a lot of prayers. And there were doors that didn't open. And I didn't find anything. And I'm knocking nothing's happening. Here's what this commentary says. Ask, seek, knock are present imperatives in the Greek. So the precise meaning is that we are to keep on asking and seeking and knocking. We are to pray without ceasing, pray without giving up and with increasing intensity. Seeking is more aggressive than simply asking and knocking is like going to someone's house in the middle of the night and rousing them out of bed to provide for your needs. First of all, I'm just going to stop right there. Is that what your prayer life is? Are you going with increasing intensity? If you've been praying something for five years, are you saying, God, help. You are my only help. You are the only one who can change this. Please, God, I'm coming back again. You know why? Because no one on earth can do what you can do. That's why I'm back. Because I know who you are. I know what you're capable of. I know that you created the galaxies. And I know that you know the stars by name. I know that you know every hair on my head. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm not giving up. Do you remember that woman, the Canaanite woman who had a demon-possessed daughter? And she called after Jesus. And he just walked away. And she kept calling after Jesus. And the disciples finally had had enough. And they're like, Jesus, send her away. She's going to drive us crazy here. And Jesus said, I was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Like, I'm not here for you. And she said, God, help me. Lord, help me. And he said, it is not right to take the crumbs or the, the scraps and give it to the dog or the food, the bread, and give it to the, to the dogs. And she said, yes, but even the dogs get the crumbs off the table. As in, you know what, Jesus? I'm not asking for a piece of bread. Give the children what they need. I get it. Just give me a crumb. Because I believe that one crumb from your hand will heal my daughter. And Jesus' response was, woman, you have great faith. And her daughter was healed from that very moment. So are you going with increasing intensity? How many of you would have turned around and run away? So the first time you call out when he just walks past you, do you go, well, he must not want to give that to me? Maybe. Or maybe you didn't care enough to come back. When she kept calling, the disciples were like, send her away. She's annoying. Yep, you know what? When you go to prayer prayer group and you pray every week for the same thing because you have not seen a change, people might get annoyed with you. I'm bringing it up again. Keep going. And when anybody gives you any reason to doubt, you just say, all I need is a crumb. I'm not asking for much. And I know who I'm asking from. Okay, moving on. Jesus does not promise that we will always get exactly what we ask for in prayer. So he's not our genie. Just tell me what you want and I will will give it to you. He simply states that our prayers will be answered. When we ask, something will be given to us. When we seek, we'll find something. When we knock, the door will be opened. God will let us come into his presence to present our requests 
and he will give us a hearing and deal with us on the basis of our needs and his far greater wisdom and mercy. Maybe he's not going to give you what you asked for. And maybe he will, but not in your time frame. I have had the amazing experience that sometimes you don't always get, and that is to have the curtain drawn back just a little bit to see why some of the things have happened that have happened. So I wrote this book, You Can Trust God When Life Hurts. And probably for the first time in five or six years, I I understand some of why I've had to go through some of the painful things in my life because God has prepared me to minister to people who are hurt with an empathy that I couldn't have had before with an understanding of what it feels like when everybody turns on you or when you're all alone, but to know that God doesn't. And I understand now that in the depths, when you're crying out and God doesn't answer you, he may be preparing you. He may be chiseling away at that sinful nature of yours, at your arrogance or your thought that, you know, you can do this. <laughs> we all get to a point where we realize that we can't. Even the Apostle Paul, when he's telling, I believe it's the Corinthians, about all that he has gone through. And he said, and yet this happened, that we would rely totally on God. All these things, the shipwrecks, being stoned and left for dead, chased out of town, imprisoned, beaten, all of it. We despaired even of life, and yet this happened so that we would rely totally on God. Life is overwhelming. There are so many things that are so much bigger than us. And yet, we serve a God who doesn't just give us what we ask for, but he gives us a whole lot more than we ask for. He answers our prayer according to his wisdom and mercy, knowing what will great impact the kingdom through us. He prepares us for the battles ahead. He helps us to get to a point of realizing that when we pray, he will give us what we need, the strength for the day. He will give us the patience for the day. He will give us every necessity we need for the day. Maybe not for the next month, maybe not for the next year, but for the day. And he'll walk with us. And that leads us to one of the passages that has become just an absolute favorite of mine. I've been doing the immeasurably more retreats with two friends um, for a year. There were four of us, but now there's three of us. And It's based on Ephesians 3, verses 20 and 21, which say, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine, to him be the glory forever and ever. God can do immeasurably more, as in you can't measure it. Exceedingly, abundantly, beyond what you'll ask far more than you can imagine. That's the God we serve. The God who knows us and wants us to walk with him, who wants us to not get caught up in all the craziness of this world, who wants us to have a kingdom impact, who wants us to be his own dear children, I was at an event this last weekend, and one of the women who spoke, her husband, had intimate knowledge of raising sheep. And she told a story that was just really impactful. And she told about how the shepherd went to feed his sheep, and there was one sheep in particular who decided to keep bucking the shepherd. Every time he went to bend down to get a bale of hay, this sheep just pushed him over 
And so the shepherd went and took the sheep and put it on his back, all four legs up in the air, because the shepherd had work to do. And that sheep was preventing him from the important work he had to do. So he went and fed the rest of the sheep, and then he went back and put the sheep back on his legs so that he could go eat. God knows what he's doing. Keep praying. Sometimes we don't understand. We don't understand our faults. We don't understand our flaws. We don't understand what God needs to do in us in order to use us. We don't understand all the prayers of everybody else and how God wants to use us in different ways. We don't, we don't understand so much, but our Good Shepherd does. And that's why we can trust him. But we have to understand the amazing power of our amazing God so that we keep going back to him time and time again so that he can answer our prayers. This has been Little Things because in God's kingdom, the little things are the big things.